guess you can hear even if the uh, microphone to me appears to be not, no, not particularly loud. Uh, yes, I'll talk about um, these topics here. And thanks for, for the invitation, and also thank you for the beautiful logo. Because um, I've seen other talks uh, starting with history, I will do the same, and I will talk about the feature history. So I try to, cr to create some motivation for the logical decoding. In the old days, uh, before uh, up to se version 7.0 of Postgres, when we committed the transaction, things were written in all the files at once, which is not, not very much uh, efficient because it's uh, random writes. And so because those changes were already written, there was no need to collect them anywhere else. So we had the double uh, advantage of having a slow system that was unable to collect changes in a single point. <coughs> but in 2001, an important uh, innovation was introduced, the write ahead log which is essentially for people that know computers but don't know databases very much, a journaling uh, attached to the database. The idea is that all changes come concurrently from the different clients, but in the end they're put in a single stream, like uh, uh, in San Francisco, the highway as seen from the hotel, and, um, and it's not possible to, you know, to change the ordering of uh, commits. It's, uh, and these things are written sequentially to uh, wall files, so-called wall files, I guess you, you see why. And um, they're collected in binary format. And, and essentially that's, uh, oops, sorry, the jump of this thing here. So um, essentially this method here speeds up commit because we transform random writes and sequential writes and also this journaling way of doing things, uh, packs things so that in the end we have the same amount of information in less blocks. So it's, it's faster. But what is important for us, from our perspective of 2015 logical decoding, is that the changes are collected in a single place. Now, in 2005, this idea of collecting the data uh, inspired an, a new innovation called point-in-time recovery. And uh, the idea is that these wall files that are a 100% record of all changes that happen to the database can be copied somewhere else. So in case... Uh, we need uh, to reconstruct a copy of our database. We can use those files from the archive and replay the changes on another server. So if we start from the same initial point and we apply the same changes, we should deterministically get to the same point. So have the ability of reproducing a copy of the database. The, we copy the whole database server. Some people say cluster, in instance, but anyway, we don't copy one database or some tables, we copy everything. And that's, uh, that, that was available since uh, version 8.0. In 2006, then, some other Im technical improvements made it possible to do this operation essentially on the fly. So when the database, when the copy of the database is replaying the changes, it may actually wait until the next uh, changes are produced without in, in ever ending recovery. And this, in this way, we we introduced the possibility of having one copy of the, of the database server, which is constantly kept up to date, which in modern world is called replication. And uh, now the history uh, has a good property that you can't go on for much. At some point, like in space balls, you, you reach the present. So at some point, uh, um, two things were introduced at once. We mentioned them together because they were introduced in the same release, but they're independent improvements. I remember working on the first one without the second one, which was quite, quite uh, inconvenient. Um, the idea is that uh, while the changes are being replayed, that you can access read-only uh, the clone database and perform your read-only queries. And the, other idea, and the idea of the other half is that these changes, instead of having to wait for files to be sent and replayed, they're sent continuously in streaming in TCP IP, which essentially makes things very fast in the event that you lose your server, you have only a little amount of things that haven't been traveled to the other end. So it's, it's good. And then finally, into, we reach the present, which is not actually the present last year, but it was December, so it's rather present. It's logical decoding. What is logical decoding? Um, these changes are no longer streamed in binary format. Well, they are still streamed in binary format, but it's possible to stream them in logical format. And it's not like they are streamed in logical format. They are decoded to logical format, as the name suggests. 
So I, th I, I hope that at least in this uh, initial part of the talk, I managed to um, explain what is this meaning of logical decoding. A dear friend of mine said, oh, you're talking about psychology, because logical decoding says, at least now I think it's clear what logical decoding should be. So now that we explain how it's, what it's supposed to do, we'll give a, tech, a slightly technical overview on how it works. So that's an example of wall. Wall is like uh, the changes that happen to the data files in binary format, which is very, um, looks very professional, but is not very intelligible. It's fast because we don't care about what query was produced. We don't care, care about all the activity that didn't produce any changes in the database. We just care about the actual changes that happened. So in, in, for an example, if you run a 12-hour delete that in the end deletes zero rows, that will have no um, effect here. Um, in these uh, things here, there is no SQL. So it's not like if you put together the bytes, uh, you see insert into, no, there is no SQL. It's only the actual changes produced by the commands that you run. So there is very little logical information. I don't say no, uh, there is no logical information because there is a, there is a timestamp with some approximation, but practically there is, there is only a list of binary changes, which means it's not very flexible. It's not possible to take away one of the changes because every change is linked to the previous one in the sense that you're supposed to apply all changes in all, all, all in sequence without removing any more of them. You cannot understand what they mean unless you're Alan Turing, because <laughs> you look, it, 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 Alan Turing was able to look at the LEDs and uh, see, oh, this is A, F, G, but um, it, you're not supposed, to, it, how can you say what it means? Not, it's not only a question of decoding in your mind the ones and the zeros, it's a question that changing that part of that data file produces one effect or another effect, depending on what was before. So in order to see what it, me what it ma makes, you actually have to apply it. So it's like a sort of blind beer testing session. Not, not very, very, it's maybe, it's <coughs> difficult to evaluate without trying. And the other thing, you cannot change these changes safely. I, you know, some people have tried to modify this this stream to remove some of the changes in a way which is not damageable. But it's, it's always like uh, um, going there with uh, iron tools operating on a high voltage cabin. You don't really feel safe, do you? Mm -hmm. And um, essentially, this is what we had until uh, a few months ago. The other thing which is important in terms of replication, which is a side topic of this talk, is that it's not possible to merge changes from different systems. You, f you have one database server that produces its ones and zeros, another one that produces another list of ones and zeros. You can't say, look, I want a database with both changes merged into a in single sequence. It's not possible because, well, if you don't see why it's not possible, but I think it, it's clearly evident. How can you, you can't understand what it means. How, how can you mix it together with some, uh, something else that you don't understand? Logical changes are much easier to treat. Instead of having a list of zeros and ones, we are able to have a list of uh, logical consequences as opposed to binary. So logical as opposed to physical. So we have the change which is meant to re be represented by those numbers as opposed to the numbers themselves. So now it is possible actually to operate because we can understand what, 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 we can understand what these changes mean. So we have uh, lots of possibilities, uh, and uh, for it's possible, for instance, to analyze the changes, <coughs> like uh, what inserts uh, are being run. But, uh, it's possible to do more meaningful analysis, of course. It's possible to modify the changes, because now you can understand what it means and say, I want to turn all the hellos in <coughs> because I'm in a bad mood. You, you can do it. You can reorder changes within reason, of course, because uh, clearly things must, it's not like if you reorder for any permutation of the changes, you get something that works. But it's possible to say, I, I do this before this, because one of those changes does not require all the previous changes to have happened already. 
it's possible to merge them with other changes. Now, why, why not? You have like 10 servers. Each server is producing a sequence of updates, deletes, and inserts. You just put them all, all together. <coughs> so how it actually works is under the hood. We, call, we talk about decoding because uh, the way it works is that these logical changes are not produced separately from the binary ones. There is some sort of uh, great re reverse engineering going on. So we have already the file changes in wall. That's uh, available since a long time. And uh, those changes are decoded to table changes. So there the Postgres is able to see these changes to this file actually mean having removed those rows from those tables. One uh, uh, important thing which is not important in itself, but it's important because it's different from what it used to be, is that we only do DML. So logical decoding does not work on uh, things like create table or uh, alter user and so on. Now, you will say, OK, well, good. You, you are able to see the zeros and ones and see what they mean in terms of table. Yes, it's not that easy, because when you introduce a technology, it must work in 100% of the cases. It cannot only work in 95%. So what if the table has been renamed? The same file will now work for a different table. And this is just one thing. But of course, you have columns, rename. You have all the possible operations that don't change what file you're working on, but change actually what object you're working on. And so you need the map between tables and files, which is uh, required for decoding and is defined in the catalog. <coughs> now, the problem is uh, uh, it, it, the catalog used to be not transactional. And even when it's been made transactional, uh, a separate mechanism for acquiring snapshot has been, has been introduced for, for this implementation. So this was just uh, a big piece of work. And also the output. Where do we, wh what do we do with these changes? Where do we put them? Logical decoding transforms the data, but uh, you, they are streamed by wall sender. So the way it works, essentially, the same mechanism that used to send the wall before, now sends the changes in whatever format they are. And what you have to provide is actually the transformation plugin. So you can decide uh, the way you, what, what you do with those changes. So this is uh, the classical uh, way Postgres works in terms of uh, wall of binary changes. So you have your application, the application rests to the back end. See, it's a blue arrow, which means uh, a logical arrow. So the application says, insert one, delete two, and so on. Then the back end part of Postgres, this gray thing here is Postgres, takes the query and uh, finds out what it means in terms of uh, does the calculation and then emits a list of binary changes. And these binary changes is written to the wall, which is uh, in a directory called pgxlog. Then there is a process called wall sender, in case you have replication, for instance, that reads the wall and sends it to another Postgres, which with a process called wall receiver, will receive the wall and reapply it. So you see all the arrows here are red, meaning they are binary. They are opaque. They are uh, in inintelligible. With logical decoding, the picture is slightly different. Now, the wall sender is still a wall sender, but it has a plugin that you can, as the name suggests, you can provide it. Because of this plugin, the wall sender is able to get those changes and transform them. You can see that the plugin requires logical, of course, access to the catalog. So the plugin says, OK, we are changing those files. What do they mean? Oh, this is table ABC, and that's table DEF, and column so and so. And then the data is sent. And now you see here, you don't have Postgres anymore. You, you can have whatever you want here. It may be a printer that prints on paper all the, well, I know it's a silly example, but just to make a point which is something different. Because now the format is variable, it can be adapted to whatever target you want. Yes, in case you want, you can also put another database, just in case you find some database which is preferable to Postgres. 
So what use cases are with, with logical decoding? The talk is, this talk here is focused on um, auditing, but it's also possible to do replication, which can be seen in some sort of auditing itself in the sense that you have another system that receives changes. So on that system, you can check some things, but I, mean, I'm, I know I'm stretching the, the blanket a little, but it, would, it wouldn't be nice to, to, to make a talk about logical decoding without talking about replication. That explains uh, the lapsus, right? Um, first of all, we can now do selective replication. We can say, I want only to replicate some tables. Why? Well, because now I know what table is concerned by what, what piece of wall. I can have bidirectional replication which is a, a project which has been worked on by my colleagues. Uh, there is a website, of course. Uh, there is a wiki in the Postgres project. The idea is that this thing will go into mainstream Postgres as soon as uh, uh, agreed with, by all the community and so on. The, what is the problem with uh, bidirectional? As, as you may guess, bidirectional means that from here, changes are sent there, but also from here, changes are sent there. And it's all right, but the problem is, what if you do two things that are incompatible, like uh, update Gianni set money plus 50, and update Gianni set money minus 20? What do you do? You have to resolve this conflict. You can't do both, because they're incompatible. Because it's money, you may decide, OK, I sum them. So plus 50 minus 20 is plus 30. But it depends on what it is. In other cases, you may decide, I discard the oldest change because the, I want the most up to the updated one, or whatever you want. So you need to have conflict resolution if you want to communicate to do replica in both directions. And the only way to resolve conflicts is to actually understand what's going on. You cannot resolve conflicts between two bunches of, of ones and zeros. You can do, you, you could, if you try to do anything without understanding, of course, you will produce something incompatible. Another possibility is to do less by doing more. No, I'm joking, just do less. You can do unidirectional replication. So the same replication as before, but now, instead of using uh, binary data, you use the logical data. And what is the, the um, point of doing this? Well, you have, uh, something that you had before, but with less restrictions. With unidirectional replication, because you don't replicate the binary wall, the, the receiving side must not necessarily be in read-only mode. So you can have temporary tables, uh, you can have uh, sequences, you can have it a different version of Postgres, so because, suppo because you, you tried Postgres, you will never change, and so you will, we want to be for Postgres forever, so you want to upgrade to a new version, and so on. So these are all the use cases you get about replication. But there are also other use cases. Like one could do logical archiving. Why not? Instead of logical decoding, this is some sort of form of uh, you have a product. In, you produce a wall continuously. Instead of copying wall files as they are, you may copy the logical output in whatever format you find suitable. You may do diagnostics. So you have a system, uh, and you receive these things, and you have some sort of constraints or assertions on the data itself. And you say, every time I have an update of these, I must have two inserts of that and one delete of that. <laughs> and if you don't receive them, you say, error, inconsistent transaction submitted. It's some sort of a more uh, general version of uh, constraints. If you, for instance, if you try to, to model uh, a football team using the classical relational theory, and you have a, a row for every player, it's very difficult to tell the database that you must have 11 players in a team. There's no way with classical. So having this possibility to implement a, a bit more semantics in checks may, may be useful. But of course, I'm, I'm leaving the last po point, the most important point, last. So you can do auditing. You know what it means, auditing. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here, especially because it's the last talk. But um, the idea is that we want to look at those changes in order to inspect them and do some and make sure that things go right. So, comparing the what um, was the previous replication, the binary one, with the modern one, the logical one, this table here I think gives uh, some sort of quick glance. 
So the binary replication was at the level of instance, at the level of database server. When you have a um, binary wall, it, rep it represents the whole instance. When you have logical wall, it only represents one database. Why? Because it uses the catalog. Because the catalog is not database-wide. Yes, you have some part of the catalog that are equal in all databases, and most of the catalog is in one database. So logical decoding works in that database. In binary uh, wall, you have DML, DDL, DCL, all these things means, all possible kind of changes. DML is like uh, insert, update, and delete. DDL means uh, alter table, uh, create uh, index, and so on. DCL is like data control, um, grant, uh, and so on. All these kind of things are all changes to the database because they are changes, but they are divided in categories. And logical decoding, as we've seen, is only concerned with DML. So if you want to do auditing of uh, people giving access to everybody, you, you should use a different technique. The different technique you can use is that uh, other things can be captured with event triggers. Event triggers are like triggers, but they don't fire when you change a uh, row. They fire when some event happens, like create table, for instance. So they can be used to capture the rest. Another important thing is that in the binary, um, the classical wall only traces the new of every change. What does it mean? In the wall, you have a description of uh, what should be written in place of the old content, but you have no description of the old content. So you have a delete, yes, you know that you have to remove a row. You don't have any information about what row was deleted. The row that was deleted was, is the one that happened to unfortunately be there. In the logical decoding instead, for many reasons, there is also some support for the old people that write triggers are familiar with new and old. But the idea is that in the unit of change, we have information about what was the content before and what is the content afterwards. So our wall effectively can go, can also go backwards in theory. Because we have, for every change, we have what is before and what is after. So essentially, in an update, you have information about what was before. Also because if you want to update a row, you must see what row you want to update. And also for a delete. And uh, you have a command called uh, replica identity, is an option in alter table, that you can use to control the amount of old which is tracked in the wall. So it will be possible to implement time travel. <laughs> but People uh, with the same color of hair, like me, will remember that Postgres used to have time travel, and it was actually removed 17 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, you still have people that want to implement time travel. Um, the reason was performance. I'm, I'm, honestly, I, I read it in the release notes. I, I wasn't around there. Well, I was around, but not around Postgres. There is even an extension, so if you implement time travel, you are guilty of not reading the documentation as well as ignoring the history. So if you, want, if you badly want to implement time travel, you can use the extension called time travel, which is not really hidden in PostgreSQL. So before coding, you should evaluate costs versus benefits and also check the history to avoid the little parentheses. Anyway, how does replica identity work? Replica identity, you can select uh, how much information is tracked of every change. So for every row that is deleted, if replica identity is known, it means that in the logical wall, you have nothing about the old row. If replica identity is full, you have everything. So you will have trace of the whole row. You can say using index in the sense we will trace only those columns covered by a certain index. Why is that? Well, it's a quick way to indicate columns. Why not? And also the default, which, will be, which is called default, and means if you have a primary key, the columns covered by that primary key. Otherwise, nothing. Now, I'll do a very minimal example. The example was written for another conference that in Spain where it made a bit more sense, but I think it's, it's bad the form to rename tables and pretend that the example is original. So I did not rename tables. 
How do you configure logical decoding? I'm talking about Postgres 9.4, so you can do these things and stop uh, using editors. It's very convenient. So you have to set wall level to logical, which means our wall must be <coughs> augmented with all the information required for logical decoding. And then you may set that you have uh, some uh, replication slots. Why? Because replication slots are required for logical decoding. Essentially, a replication slot is some sort of pointer in the sequence of wall. So it remembers that we have read wall up to here. And so the next time we'll, we'll, go, we'll go a bit further starting from here. It's a way to avoid reading the same thing twice or to avoid skipping things and inverting things. Then we restart. And we create a logical replication slot. See, it's not very difficult. It's just a thing you can do in SQL. And the output you get is the name of the slot you've created, which you knew already, but still. And, uh, the position, which is uh, exactly what point in the sequence of wall you have reached so far. So this slot starts at uh, the file number 001, offset a, uh, so th that number there. So you can go and pick changes. See? You run this SQL and you get. Uh, Using, uh, using this nice function, PG's logical slot pick, pick changes, which is essentially a sort of a test uh, facility to, to read <coughs> the logical wall. So what changes are available in this slot? And you get this nice sequence. So here you have a start of transaction 9980, then commit of transaction 9980. From the point of view of logical decoding, this transaction was rather useless. But n we know why, because Logical decoding only covers DML. So maybe this transaction did something else. Fine. Then transaction 9981. And then we have actually a table. And this table had an insert of a row with those two values. So this row has a column called, in this insert, we have a column called country of type text with this value here. And a column called count of type integer with this value here. So see, very intelligible, much better than a sequence of zeros and ones. And then we have the commit. And uh, nice, gives some sort of uh, feeling that to be on, in charge. What was the SQL that was used to, to produce this example? Well, you create a table, and that was transaction, the empty one, so only the DL. And then you insert these values in the table. Quite simple. Well, it's a minimal example. When you're finished, you must clean up. You must drop your replication slot. Why? Because a replication slot is a way to tell Postgres, wait until like, I will get this wall. Keep it in the fridge for me. So it's not really nice to say to somebody, keep it, this in the fridge for me and then disappear for 20 years. If in this case it's Postgres, so we, we will not say, oh, right, it's been six months. Postgres will keep it forever, and uh, you know it's not good for the ability to store wall if you keep wall forever. The disk will finish. So the, the, uh, now that we've explained logical decoding with some examples, how do we do auditing with this functionality? Actually, how, how much of auditing we can do with logical decoding? First of all, we do single database audit. <coughs> it's not actually a limitation, but it's one peculiarity of this system. If you have 50 databases, you must apply this technique 50 times to each database. Performance, now you may think, OK, wall is very fast. It, this was written in a slide. But what about logical decoding? Maybe I cannot do it because my server will crash because of their exceptionally heavy workload. Actually, this is not the case. Logical decoding is very efficient because the transformation is done in the cheapest part of the mall. So before outputting the data. If somebody is familiar with the replication based, uh, with uh, trigger based replication, that has a cost, because every time you change a row, you must run a function in some sort of language. And that row has to be written again somewhere else after being written in the database and in the world. Here, we intercept the change the moment it's written. So there's no, almost no overhead. Unless, of course, your plugin is a, a plugin that does all sorts of expensive things. But it's, it's possible to do this. 
there, there are some generic benchmarks from a couple of colleagues that uh, show essentially that the performance of replication based on logical decoding is similar to the performance of, of the binary replication, which means it's efficient. What do we log? Not the SL. Well, it's difficult to audit uh, the SL anyway. What is the SL? Select. How can you audit select? You cannot put some sort of alarm. Uh, ah, you see this row. It's not possible at the moment. <coughs> so you cannot uh, do DDL, but you can use event triggers. And that's, actu that's actually the way the bidirection replication works, by capturing these things with event triggers. You cannot do DCL, and then you can use event triggers as well, but only for some of them. Event triggers don't cover things like uh, alter user and so on, because they live uh, outside of the uh, database. We don't even log DML. So what do we log? We log the consequences of DML. We don't log the fact that it was an insert, it was an update. Actually, we cannot tell an update from an insert and a delete. From the point of view of logical decoding, it's the same. You have two rows that disappear and two other rows that appear. It's not possible to have a trace of update of delete at zero rows, which is actually probably a good thing. You don't want to, update to uh, audit a change. But maybe you want to audit a change of the fact that somebody makes a change and then that somebody there so if you want to cover these things, you have other solutions, with, uh, all based on event triggers. Um, there is an extension that will, uh, is being discussed in the hackers list to become part of Postgres, PG Audit. That extension uses some features in 9.5, hopefully uh, it will become part of Postgres, and then you will be able to install it and have it set uh, audit uh, to DDL, uh, DCL, and then you will get the nice auditing features. So what can we do? We can audit in the SQL interface. We can log into log tables. But of course, we must not log the log tables themselves, because otherwise we log the log in the log, and then we, it's not a good idea. This logging uh, system is like the one in the minimal example, and uh, it's from the, within the same database only. So you cannot access one database from another one. Careful, the super user can go in the log table and delete all the compromising evidence. Is it really a limitation? I mean, if you don't trust your super user, it, it's probably already wrong. So if the, fa the fact that the super user can alter things, maybe not a downside. The good thing is that this is not a separate service. It's something that uh, is always available, is in, po in your Postgres, so you don't have to manage daemons, start, stop, and, and these kind of things. And you can query and monitor in real time. So it's good. You have your auditing tables. You want to see now what is the situation. Select whatever from auditing, and you get an updated view of your auditing situation. Another possibility is to use an external plugin. Remember the plugin that, uh, so instead of using uh, the coding to write into log tables, you have a plugin that puts the data somewhere else. And then, uh, of course, uh, it's better because it's not possible to alter. Not even if you're a super user, you can go and delete the evidence because the evidence now is somewhere else. This is more expensive because it's a separate service <coughs> and it could be down, so it may not be viable to have it. You have to manage a service, and of course, you have to write your custom plugin, which is, uh, I mean, you have to do it, so it takes time to do things. Um, so maybe you can do it later. So you can start with a simpler setting and then have your custom plugin. It's not really difficult to do a custom plugin. This is an example from Postgres, the Postgres code. There is an example of uh, output plugin. Of course, you need to do some C. And of course, this is only the beginning. It's not very significant. But the idea here is to, is to tell you that there is an example of an output plugin, which is nicely written and made by Postgres, by the Postgres community. So it's some sort of authoritative. And you can start from here and then create your own plugin. So are there any questions? Yeah, I think it was first. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm doing uh, binary replication, I need to take a, uh, <coughs> a base backup. And this shows me changes in rows. But is there some way to log the initial state of a table? Like to, if, I, if I'm using this, for example, 
I mean, do you either set it up at the beginning of the table existing, or is there some way to you know, send an initial state? Um, it's a good question. But we are talking about, when you talk about the replication, we're talking about a pro an ongoing project, some, something which is still work in progress and changes fast. So you, there is a wiki you, you can download and so and so. Um, at the moment, you can start from a base backup. And then because, remember, there's little numbers here. Um, those little numbers. Uh, yes, and uh, that's related to one of those numbers. And then changes can start from there. But it's not something like, uh, it's not a one-liner. Still, it will hopefully become. But, yeah. Oh, the same question. Okay, right. Yeah. Oh, um, so you mentioned one of your slides something about um, online upgrading. Yes. What exactly did you I mean that if you have binary replication from 9.4, you can only go to 9.4. Oh, right. If you want to upgrade to 9.5 without switching off your database, you may have a 9.5 receiving side and then a replication that goes from 9.4 to 9.5, which is not possible with binary replication. Sorry? DDR, which of course is the in, uh, thing that's going to be using this infrastructure, or one of the things. Why would I want to use that? What's the advantages of using that? Well, they, you have the classical use cases for multi-master. Right. Uh, one of them would be that you don't have to manage uh, the state of the cluster in sense of uh, master uh, standby, promotion, failover, of these kind of things. It's not a question of performance, because multi-master uh, at least for write transactions, cannot go beyond the performance of a single node. So it's not a way to have a more powerful database. It's probably a way to simplify management, especially in distributed environment, or in those cases where you know that the number of conflicts are little. It isn't the same wall log. Actually, let me go back to the picture. No, why is it the same? Well, because it will, we have all the information here. So why collect it twice? It will be. Well, I want to send my binary replication data. To one yes, binary. it's actually, oh, uh, I, I get your question now. Yes. Here is only one wall sender. But in Postgres, you can have several wall senders in parallel. If you have replication from one master to five standbys, you have five wall senders. Now, there's, you can have like three wall senders that send logical and three that send binary to, so you have both at the same time. Each one of them can either be logical or physical, but you can have as many as you want. Well, yes, you can have uh, different plugins, yes. In fact, when you create a logical slot here, you specify the, the plugin name. Let me go to the example quick. This is the, the name of the plugin for this slot. Uh, a, a slot is a pointer. So to remember what point we were in the, in the yeah, uh, maybe the name is not very, it's like a cursor that tells you, you are up to this point here in the wall. And if you have 10, wall, ten slots, you will have 10 pointers that remember your position. Like yeah, yeah. Okay, this, this one, well, if it fails, it's a plugin. So it will, if, it, if a plugin fails, it crashes the server. But it's, you are supposed to, to make plugins. Replication, it, it's up to the, to the specific replication solution to have timeouts, retries. But this is handled by Postgres already. So Postgres standard has replication with the reconnect facility. And it's, the idea is that we reuse the same mechanism. So anyway, I think other questions may be taken separately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.